Well, the two things to make really clear about falsified medicines uh, at the outset is that there's two ways falsified medicines can get to patients. One is through the illegal supply chain, so for example, the internet. And if you choose and take the risk of buying medicines online, for example, without a prescription, you're far more likely to get a substandard, unlicensed or falsified medicine. The other part is the legal supply chain, which is the licensed supply chain, and the chances of getting a falsified medicine through this route are extremely remote. That said, it does happen, and there are some initiatives going around at the moment to address that issue. For example, the European Commission has invested a lot of time and effort in the falsified medicines directive, uh, which is about trying to close the loops and gaps which allow people to bring falsified medicines uh, onto the market. In addition to that, a number of countries, uh, for example, in the UK, the MHRA, as the medicines regulator, has a national strategy, a falsified medical product strategy, to also try and uh, address this issue. Yeah, with the internet in general, um, there is an increased likeliness today uh, for somebody to engage in e-commerce. It's very convenient. You can do it from your bedroom. You can do it from the privacy of your home. Once you click, it may be two days before your product arrives. Yeah. People get comfortable buying books, clothes, other commodities from the internet. And often they then make and take the risk of buying medicines off the internet as well because they think it may be convenient because they think it may be a shortcut and that's where they really risk themselves. So there is an increase in e-commerce in general and that includes um, the dangerous supply of uh, pharmaceuticals. But again, a lot of work is going on uh, between a number of organisations uh, to tackle this issue. Um, meetings like Pharma Crime are extremely important forums for organisations to come and discuss the issues. At the moment, Pharma Crime is open to law enforcement um, and government, uh, and the three most important competencies or ministries that have an interest are medicines regulators, the police, and customs, because they all have a part to play in tackling the issue of falsified medicines. So, for me and for organisations like ours, it's a great opportunity to come and share our experiences, listen to other people, share knowledge as well, and then hopefully at the end of this process develop some best practice on how to tackle this issue. Because the criminals, they respect no boundaries, uh, which is why international cooperation and cooperation, multi-sector cooperation, is extremely important. Um, and going forward, I think one other aspect which pharma crime can reach out even further is to engage industry and the private sector and that's not just the pharmaceutical manufacturers, that's also the traders, but also if you're going to tackle the internet, potentially those who are responsible for the governance of the internet, for example, the registrars, internet service providers and registries. So very important pharma crime conference, good forum to share experience and, uh, and, and I hope it continues to do so. One of the risks about the legitimate supply chain is that although the cases are very rare, the impacts can be uh, potentially really bad in terms of the volumes of patients that could end up getting a medicine. And one thing we have to be very um, careful of is that with the new falsified medicines directive and other strategies that are coming in place, that we don't become complacent. We still must be very vigilant and make sure that we apply the new regulations and we make sure that systems and processes do work and don't think that just because we have a new directive, the problem is solved. The criminals are always looking for new ways to bypass regulations, so there is no room for complacency.